Theocracies and of all the forms of government, theocracy is the worst. Whenever clerical authority is claimed by popes, by Protestant interpreters of the Bible, by the supreme leader of Iran, its acceptance is contrary to the first principles of reason. To summarise, the clerical fundamentalist views of law and the state, of which Sharia is an, both an example and a product, are fundamentally misconceived conceptually. Laws are made by people, and we must always recognise that that is the case. They're pretty silly, there's usually far too many of them. They're pretty irrational, but that's the nature of our species. So when I'm asked to defend secular society, I must refuse all societies are secular, just some of them exist on, as the French would say, the idée, the fantasy in our terms, that they are not secular. The laws under Sharia are chosen by lawmakers, just as much as the laws in America. They find, they find themselves bound by something they regard as higher and older. The Quran, in the case of Islam, the Constitution, in the case of America. But in both cases, it's a form of dishonesty. Some of them operate on the same presence. Revelation is what a rational person could never accept, unless it was completely personal and convincing. These people who are telling you God's will, how do they know? Why should you believe them? Even humanist democracy, not by any means my chosen form of government, I hasten to add, anything in which Wayne Rooney gets the vote, is not something I can be terribly sympathetic to, is better than clerical forms. And it hasn't got much going for it. Well, since you ask, what kind of government do I approve? Oh, I approve of the same form of government as the great 18th century philosophers, the Baron de Montesquieu, David Hume, Voltaire, Edmund Burke, mixed government. Government is based on more than one incompatible principle, because that is the only way in which you will avoid absolutist, tyrannical, or totalitarian government. Democracy, to a liberal, is by its very nature, pure democracy, tyranny. Why should you obey the majority any more than you obey anybody else? Finally, in my five minutes, who gains from clerical fundamentalism? First of all, the clerical class. Note the psychosis of membership of this class. And please be prepared to consider my hypothesis that they have proved historically to be the worst of rulers. Even worse than democratic politicians. Secondly, the allies of the clerical class. This has varied under Christianity for a very long time. In Europe, it was principally landowners. And note that under one and two, in both Christianity and Islam, historically, this has meant chiefly men. And I don't want to bang on about Islam and women, because I, do, I really don't think, historically compared with Christianity, Islam's record on gender is all that bad. That's not one of my objections. My objection is a fundamental philosophical one, not to, not to the details of the particular record of Israel. And thirdly, and I think this is probably the most important point I want to make, who gains? There's another class who gains, the infantile. I visited the former Soviet Union before, during, and after its collapse. I made lots of friends with people who were yearning for freedom. They wanted to read what they wanted, write what they wanted, travel where they wanted to go, explore ideas, and so on. But I was always aware that they were a minority. <coughs> that there were a lot of people in that society who actually liked the repression of talent and enterprise, who felt more comfortable, secure in a society in which these things were repressed. The same is true for those who yearn for society with ancient permanent rules, justified by the image of an authoritarian father. A very obscure but important saying from 19th century philosopher, from Ernst Haeckel, the inventor of, our, of the word ecology and arguably of our modern concept of ecology, is ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Very obscure expression. 
Let me explain. It means that the development of society mirrors the development of an individual human being. A, a society can be childish as well as a person. Freud picked this up very strongly. I don't know if you've read Totem and Taboo, but in Totem and Taboo, he compares the people in his chair in his Viennese surgery with the people he reads about in the likes of James Fraser's anthropological works in primitive societies. So it's possible to be infantile as a society and as a person. Thus, we, and I don't mean all of us, or even most of us, but the most inspired and the most intellectual of us, grow out of the need for laws made by almighty fathers, both as individuals and as societies. Thus, I've argued for most of this short talk that to imagine that laws are ever made by anybody other than people is quite wrong, and I'm throwing it as a gratuitous insult, it is also infantile. To now by Mr. Jamal D for his five minute rebuttal. Okay, um, some quite unusual comments I have to say in uh, my view uh, of uh, what was going to be discussed today. But uh, nevertheless, I will still try to address them in a short space of time. Um, in terms of the effect, you have a summary of why the, the West or those uh, societies affected by the Enlightenment have moved so far forward and why effectively they should be a model for other societies around the world. Why we should aspire to that model and frankly we are being childish if we consider any alternative to that. It's a childish idea. Um, how can I address this childishness and how to respond to this? Well, first of all, if we look at the society and the period that has been referred to, i.e. the dominance and the development of the West in the late 18th century, 19th century, we also find in that same period of time, this is the period in which the West, and Britain was one of these uh, uh, countries, which became a first rank colonial power. So we see one of the major achievements for Britain at that time was the ability to colonize other areas of the world and bring the resources back for those areas. Likewise, it was able to actually impose itself, impose its values, impose its culture in an almost permanent way on the societies of the Islamic world and other areas of the world. So when we talk about what the West has achieved, we can't just present that as a globally positive but actually you have to acknowledge within that you're talking about colonialism, within that you're talking about taking and sucking the resources of the world and bringing them back to your own territory and that this should be viewed as an unalloyed good. Uh, so really how and on what basis would we accept that, that it makes that system a model for the rest of the world to adopt and to follow? Because surely that the result of that will be that societies around the world will look to each other from a viewpoint of exploitation. Citizens will look to each other from a viewpoint of exploitation because those are the values that emerged in that period. That's what our speaker is calling us to adopt and look upon as a mature and adult as opposed to infantile version of society. A mature and adult in, uh, version of how we can live. Likewise, effectively we are supposed to take that this model has worked because of the successes that have been achieved in the West. Well, let's take another look at that, that picture. Let's imagine, if you like, for example, it's the kind of like you have someone doing 1,500 meters, or you have someone in, in the middle of a marathon, and you actually say, okay, well, what we'll do, there's a marathon taking place, but we will measure who won by looking at who's leading at 13 miles. You're only halfway through the race. New latecomers can actually emerge. Your front runners can run out of stamina, they can run out of puff. So likewise, you can praise a society because of the achievements that it's made. That doesn't disprove that other societies can actually overtake such societies. Likewise, with the Islamic world, as I talked about the Sharia and the values that the Muslims embraced, we found there was a period in which Muslims actually started to decline. And likewise, they can revive. 
So that would not tell you just the mere fact that they went through that process, okay, those values are wrong. Because in our view, looking at Islamic history, we found when the Muslims were actually judging by and ruling by the Islamic system, they actually were progressing and developing and seeing a flowering of economy, philosophy, technology, and so on. And when they started to abandon this, they declined. So we wouldn't say that that shows the principles they were applying in their period of enlightenment, their period of flowering, were wrong because later on they started to weaken vis-a-vis -vis the Western states. Likewise, one could say on the same grounds, well, look at China today. Look how strongly the Chinese economy is developing. Look how much research and development is actually taking place in China. And based on that, we can say, well, that's a model for us to adopt as well. Because why? We can see that there are fruits of the way that that society is moving. Just the same way that many people saw when uh, Yuri Gagarin uh, from the Soviet Union under communist Russia was the first man to go into space, that this proves to us that this system is the best system to follow, i.e. the communist system. So there's no way, just by looking at those historical achievements at a particular point in time, and at the same time ignoring all of the other issues that emerged at that time, namely colonialism, namely the fact that it was a massive reduction in life expectancy, actually, within Britain, as a result of the adoption of industrialization, because the fact was that uh, when people moved from a society in Britain which was predominantly agrarian, predominantly agricultural, they didn't benefit from being shunted into the cities and actually having very little rights recognized. That was something that was a, a fall in the society that was caused by that change that Lincoln mentions. He talks about how Voltaire found a society that was flowering. Obviously, he's talking about the elite who existed in that time. And today, we cannot judge or accept that system based purely on the fact that particular time, there were some developments, those of which Lincoln finds were productive, he praises, those which were negative, he is not de deigned to mention. So in summary, in my uh, rebuttal, I would say that effectively what you're saying is you're praising a system, what he's doing is praising a system based on certain achievements, we are supposed to take those as the most important, neglect thought about any other way of moving forward, and also about key aspects of the society to which he refers. And I'll finish there. Thanks. Okay, let's go back to the jewellery shop. Where you can walk in and out, no doors, etc. Don't know whether you've been to Romania, but there's a legend in Romania about the greatest of Romanian rulers, Vlad the Impaler who did his impaling largely on Bulgarians.